Alrighty, folks. Thank you for staying for the coveted 415 slot. Um, appreciate you guys, you guys handing out for this. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is we're going to introduce uh, the program that I'm working on. Uh, it's called the San Fernando Observatory. I'm going to talk for a little bit about our overall plans, uh, and then you're going to hear from a new colleague of mine on some of the actual substance. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't have to repeat what people have talked about a lot today, which is the fact that uh, technology has turned out to be a uh, both a blessing and a curse for a number of different democratic movements. Um, anybody who's not a professor want to say where this is and what time, what year? Tahrir Square. Square, yeah, what, 2011, that's right. So this is Tahrir Square 2011. This is kind of the pinnacle of us in the tech industry seeing the things we're building uh, as liberation technologies uh, was the movements of the Arab Spring, which were uh, clearly sparked and uh, organized on social media platforms such as Twitter and Facebook. Uh, in some cases, in like the case of Trier Square, some of the core people involved in the organizi organizing were actually employees of tech companies who had uh, returned home uh, to their countries, uh, you know, kind of spreading the word and spreading the use of these technologies. Uh, and in this time, we had a lot of hope that the kinds of technologies we're, we were unleashing were going to only serve as a tool for decentralization of power, for giving power back to people who had not had it, perhaps, uh, for the entire history uh, of their of their nation. Um, this is what Trier Square looked like two years later. So, kind of oops on us uh, for our our uh, our overconfidence, our rational exuberance about the liberation power of tech. Um, in that, uh, what actually happened, as as many of you under, know, out of the Arab Spring, was the replacement of a number of these governments uh, by equally autocratic governments, but governments that were much smarter about social media and the use of the internet. Uh, and ever since this time, uh, there has been a creeping use of the internet for authoritarian purposes. And while we've talked a lot today, including myself, about the use of the internet between countries as a, as, as a tool of warfare, especially between large powerful states like Russia and the United States or Russia and Western Europe, the truth is, is that the, the vast majority of oppressive use of the internet is happening domestically in countries around the world. That if you are being uh, manipulated or misled by disinformation, for example, that is happening by your actual government or by the ruling political party. Uh, and that is a, an issue that we kind of want to address is that part of this discussion is, is very, very focused on us here in the United States that we feel um, so aggrieved uh, in the actions that were uh, committed against our election, and I think rightfully so, but we shouldn't let our feelings about that hide the fact that technologies we've built are used in much more negative ways around the world. Um, and so while the tech industry is dealing with this, you also have uh, academia dealing with a massive revolution in the fact that there's really no area of the political or social sciences that hasn't been revolutionized by the internet. But the capability for political and social scientists to understand what's going on has not grown with the size and the scope of these technologies themselves. So you've heard from a number of prominent social scientists, Larry, uh, Frank, uh, Nate, uh, people who are real experts in this field, for them to study quantitatively what is going on when they want to look into a democracy movement, uh, say, in the ex-Soviet states, the activation energy for them is that they have to have a grad student who can write Python, and they need to sign uh, data contracts with a number of companies. They need to build a data analysis pipeline, and they need to build a bunch of different acceptance criteria for the kinds of stuff they're doing. So there's a huge amount of work you have to do if you're a social scientist or political scientist and you want to adopt what's going on. While this is going on, we also have governments struggling with these issues and struggling uh, to uh, understand, like in this hearing, uh, how does Facebook make its money? Well, we sell ads, Senator, being the, the famous answer uh, from this hearing. Um, I am not in the background there. Uh, I, I did not draw the short straw, uh, so I didn't have to be there. Um, but I, I, I am happy to say, like as somebody who worked on some of the prep for these hearings, um, it is difficult to prepare a witness for a situation where the knowledge of the questioners is so poor that it's impossible for the lawyers and technologists that are doing the prep to even try to simulate uh, the kind of questions that are going to be asked. And that is effectively what it is like to prepare a witness for a hearing like this. Um, and so we're in a situation where policymakers, uh oh, well, that was a mistake. Anyway, uh, if somebody can get a towel real fast. I'm sorry, it's, it's been a day. Oh, uh, Mike and I started our day with Joe and Mika at, four, at 5 a.m., uh, which is a great way to wake up. Um, but anyway, uh, that policymakers are really struggling with these issues and are not making decisions based upon good data-based 
uh, uh, ad advice from academia and, and from people who study these issues. So what are some of the things we can do to address this? The first is for academics, we need to build shared capabilities to study what's going on, on the internet. And the, the fact that we use the term observatory in the name of our program is not an accident. There's two reasons for it. First, the word observatory shows up nowhere in the Stanford Academic Handbook. Um, and so because I am not a program center institute, uh, or anything like that, nobody knows how to handle us and nobody knows what the rules are around our operation. So this is just a little tip for those of you who might want to operate in academia. Picking a word uh, that, that the bureaucracy doesn't know what it means is actually a fantastic way to move forward. Um, <laughs> but the, the second reason for observatory is that other fields have figured this out. So if you're an astronomer here at Stanford and you want to study uh, something going on, thank you, you want to study black holes, uh, or something like that, you don't have to go raise a billion dollars to go build your own telescope, right? You go to the, the people who run the, the Hubble telescope in Maryland, you go to the Keck in Hawaii, you go to the, uh, the folks who run the Arecibo in Puerto Rico, and you rent time on their infrastructure. So astronomy builds shared infrastructure that is reused over and over again, and that is a much more efficient way of doing that. Um, we need to have smart policy interventions, uh, so we need to figure out ways to give policymakers choices that are actually rooted in the real world. Uh, you know, there's been a number of discussions today about the power of tech companies. As you guys all know, one of the things that a lot of people are talking about right now is antitrust. And people are talking about antitrust because it's an easy thing to understand, right? But the truth is, is breaking up big tech companies who are dealing with these problems doesn't solve the problem. It creates three or four new smaller problems. Um, and we're not, those of us in academia are not providing uh, policymakers with a menu of choices that actually address these issues. And so they're reaching for the kinds of things that have worked before, right? Like we feel like there's a problem with AT&T, so we broke them up, right? Um, there were problems with the railroad, so we broke them up. And it turns out these problems are totally different. And if you're gonna come up with policy solutions, those solutions should be based upon real data. Um, and preferably, the solutions should be tested before they're actually deployed. Um, and the third is that we need to uh, figure out how to educate students to prevent these problems in the future. Um, and so to talk about briefly about the, the, the ways we're addressing those three missions with the observatory. Um, the first is we want to build a shared research capability mm -hmm. that we want to slot in but above kind of standardized technologies that already exist. We live actually in a wonderful time for people that want to do data science uh, because 10 years ago, if you wanted to do the kind of work we do now, where you take terabytes or petabytes of data and you sort through it, uh, looking, doing things like sentiment analysis or trying to understand what people are saying and then figure out the kinds of topics they're talking about, that used to be something that you'd have to spend months or years writing software to do. And now you can do that with off the shelf technologies. And so we have a basic set of technologies that are great. Here at Stanford, we have a bunch of people at the top who are super duper deep experts in different areas of the world um, and different political issues. We want to slot in there in the middle to connect those two parts up. And so we're going to build a shared technical capability that allows us to do all of the hard activation energy parts, the building of the telescope. We're going to build that telescope once. And so that means building up a big data pipeline. It means building up a bunch of machine learning capabilities. Um, it means signing legal contracts. Uh, this has been alluded to a couple times today. The legal issues around studying this kind of stuff are really, really complicated. Uh, in fact, Nate is an expert in this and has been working to try to create a safe harbor for academics uh, to effectively have an exception from certain privacy laws. Um, but that is something that we will do once so that you don't have to go through that six month process of negotiating with a Twitter or Facebook. If you're an academic, we'll have done it one time. And then we're also gonna build the infrastructure to be studying things uh, from sites that are not that legit. And so you can integrate with kind of legitimate sites that have API access under certain rules. And then for sites like the ones that intentionally host white supremacist content, the kinds of sites uh, that birthed uh, the Christchurch shooter, they're the kinds of people that we're going to be collecting data from. So then when academics want to study what's going on, we have that stuff in our, our data systems. And then as important as the technical work is our goal is to train students in doing these analytics. And that's why we're hiring professionals who come from deep data analytical backgrounds to train students to do this work. And so the theory is just like with an observatory of a telescope is that people, social scientists from outside, from around Stanford will come to us and say, Perhaps you know something interesting is going on between India and Pakistan. I'm an expert in the Indian Pakistani conflict. I would like to understand what's going on on social media related to this. And then we can say, okay, great. Well, Sally has time. She has been trained in all this. She has uh, all the legal 
agreements in place. We're going to assign Sally to work on your project. Um, and then we can combine both the deep expertise as well as the data analytics capabilities and existing infrastructure to go do that work together. And our, my thesis is if we create this, they will come. That if we create this kind of capability, that we will unlock all kinds of research that never would have happened because, again, the activation energy for any individual PI here is so incredibly high. Um, we're working on high quality policy interventions. Uh, so publications that have real impact in the way people are looking at things around. One of the things we'll, we'll be publishing are scene setters for big elections. Again, everybody's paying attention to US and Western Europe. The truth is, is there's something like 85 major elections every year, right? Every single one of those has been impacted by the internet. And in a number of developing democracies, it's the possibility that any election could be their last election. Right? And that is something that we take for granted here when we talk about these things, and there's not people paying attention to that. So one of the things we'll be doing is studying upcoming elections, looking at the signs that there might be a risk there, uh, and publishing the things that we observe that we think people inside the country, the media, uh, globally, um, and the tech companies themselves should be considering uh, when they prepare for those kinds of elections. Uh, we'll be doing our own analysis of real-time activity in certain countries, um, and then post-mortems on discovered information operations to spread the lessons learned. Uh, this is something that is missing from a lot of the conversation, is that you will hear uh, X company took down 500 accounts belonging to this group, but what you don't hear is what can we learn from their operations to do better in the future. Our goal is to run workshops that bring people together that have never been together before. Uh, we just ran our first one uh, with uh, the Hoover uh, Institution with Jack Goldsmith uh, that brought together people from tech and government to talk about the relationship between Western democracies and the tech companies. Uh, and we're looking in September to run a new workshop on how do you balance security and privacy in a world that's moving towards end-to-end -end encryption. And so we will bring together civil society from the privacy side, civil society from the safety side, these organizations like Nick, Mick, and Thorne that work on child safety, uh, people representing law enforcement, the tech companies and academics to talk about these difficult problems of where does the responsibility of the company start and end and what kind of privacy gives are we willing to give for certain levels of safety and security. Uh, and then we're doing direct engagement uh, with, with DC and other uh, policymakers whenever possible. Uh, and then part of our goal is to uh, educate students to change how they act in their professional careers. Um, and the two directions I'm interested in is I'm interested in finding people who are not CS majors who might have been intimidated from, from studying computer security in the past and bring them towards the geeks, and then find the geeks and bring them towards uh, people with a broader set of experience. Uh, and the first one is a class that we call the Hack Lab. I wanted to call this Hacking for Poets, uh, but I was that was rejected, I don't know why. All these rules at universities. Um, uh, but this is an introduction to cybersecurity for non-CS majors. You can take it if you're a CS major, but I, there is a very good CS class uh, taught by Dan Bonet that, that requires programming and is a lot more rigorous. Um, this is an introduction to cybersecurity that actually teaches these kids how to hack. Um, and so we had 96 students in the fall, 30 of them were MBAs. So it was actually our largest cohort. Our second largest cohort was uh, law students. Um, by the way, if you ever teach MBAs and law students, you should ask them where they're sitting. You will find that the MBAs are all sitting in the back and the sides with red party cups, and the law students are all in the front row with their laptops open, studiously taking notes. It's actually pretty amazing. Um, but the MBAs will ask all the professors out to dinner, which I found like something that's changed uh, since I was in school, but like th they're very good at networking, right? Um, but like this was actually a really successful uh, class uh, that students learned a lot. Um, there are now 15 lawyers running around who can hack your Wi-Fi. So uh, I feel like that combination of skills is actually quite dangerous, and I'm very proud of it. Um, and my goal is that we're teaching, you know, they're, they're probably not going to become professional pen testers. Like, these are not going to become security researchers. But these students are going to become executives and companies. They're going to become uh, prosecutors of the Department of Justice. They're going to go work in the White House one day. Uh, and, and now, when they read a report of SQL injection was used to do something bad, they can be like, oh man, I, I did that once. I remember doing that in that class. And they'll have a little bit of hands-on understanding of what's actually going on under the curtains. Um, this year, uh, we're expanding the class. We're cross-listing it with law. And there will be an explicit law and policy lecture that Rihanna Pfeffercorn will teach. Rihanna, you want to wave to everybody? Um, and so uh, that means you can actually get ABA credit for it, um, which is a lot of fun. And then the other th class that we're teaching, uh, which I think is for the first time this class has ever been taught anywhere, is a trust and safety engineering class. Uh, so one of my theories is that we're 
as an industry, we're kind of in the same place that the industry was in the 1990s on core information security, right? So in the 1990s, nobody knew how to write secure software. You couldn't study, um, even though uh, I went to a computer science department that's actually a little highly, more highly ranked than this one, um, we still did not have an undergraduate security class. Uh, you had to take like graduate seminars in security. Uh, you couldn't study security. You couldn't learn how to write secure code in college. And people in industry didn't know how to do it. And that's where we are on more general trust, safety, and privacy issues, is people don't know how to build products that are trustworthy for people to use, and students are not learning these skills, and they're not being exposed to the downside of technologies. Um, and so our goal is to educate those students, is to no longer graduate CS students from Stanford who think that they can just make apps that allow people to anonymously send photos to each other, and it's not going to cause huge amounts of abuse, right? Um, and so. Uh, we can train a couple hundred students a year here at Stanford, but what we'd really like to do is to spark a revolution in this teaching. And so our goal is to build a class here at Stanford that then we open source and we make free and that we, we cause dozens of, of, of uh, universities to teach it around the world. I um, mean, this is like the basic syllabus of what it is. Uh, it is by far the most depressing. It's going to be the most depressing CS class that you could possibly take, right? Like we're dealing with some really difficult issues like terrorism, non-consensual intimate imagery, uh, sextortion, the exploitation of children. But the truth is, is that if you're going to go build these technologies, you need to be exposed to the problems that have been faced before, right? Like it is your responsibility to understand, honestly, the mistakes my generation made so that your generation can go out and make totally new different mistakes, right? But at least make them different mistakes. Let's not repeat history over and over again. Um, and so this is going to be, we're teaching this in the fall. Uh, we have about a dozen people from industry who are helping with the content creation and, and doing guest lectures uh, during the year. Um, that's another advantage we have here at Stanford is that 10,000 people work on trust and safety within uh, five counties of here. Uh, and so we have the ability to recruit people to go work on the content, to give guest lectures, and then we'll capture all that. We'll capture that on video. We'll capture the, the content, and we're going to freely release that to everybody else. Um, uh, which I think hopefully will allow other universities to teach it, even if they don't have the ability to pull in that, those kinds of skill sets. Um, so who are we in the the, uh, the observatory right now? Uh, there's me, uh, there's Elena Christ. Elena, you want to wave? Elena is our assistant director. Uh, she's making all of the trains run on time, and she's the, the driving force behind all of these really complicated projects, like building the trust and safety class. Um, Elena is a, a Stanford grad and has a lot of experience uh, building these kinds of programs and that she helped stand up CEPR, the Economic Research uh, Institute, and was incredibly successful in building something there. Um, I'm really happy to announce for the first time that Renee DeResto will be joining us as our research manager. Renee, you can wave. Renee, yeah, let's give her a hand. Yes. You may know Renee from such reports as the Senate Select uh, Committee on Intelligence's report on Russian interference. Renee does, has done a, a lot of writing and analytics. Uh, she has a computer science background like me. She is part of the Academic Unwashed with a computer science degree from a public university, um, and, uh, but has gone out and worked for the CIA, uh, has worked uh, for a variety of companies, is currently a fellow with Mozilla, uh, and will be joining us to manage a team of researchers doing this kind of work, including students. Um, and then Shelby Grossman, uh, Shelby, you want to wave? Shelby's joining us as our first research scientist. Shelby has a PhD from Harvard, uh, has expertise in African democracies, and will be part of us trying to expand the scope of this research uh, beyond the traditional world of, of really just focusing on Western democracies. Um, and so our theory is if we mix up people with very, very different backgrounds, uh, but with a shared mission, maybe we will do research that has never been seen before in academia, uh, and perhaps formats that have never been seen before in academia. Um, and then just some quick thank yous to uh, two organizations that have helped this happen. The first is the, the Hewlett Foundation, um, which provided our initial grant money. Uh, and then uh, uh, Felicia's Ventures, a venture capital firm, is funding the creation of the Trust and Safety course uh, and funding us being able to create free content that we can release out uh, publicly. Um, so that's it for my part. Uh, what we're now going to hear from Renee actually talking about uh, some of the more substantive parts about some of the issues that are, we're dealing with right now and that the observatory will start uh, dealing with. So why don't you come up with Renee, I'll pull up your slides. Uh, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Hi everybody, I just got off a plane. Um, I was, uh, I had to give a talk in New York this morning. So, yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, yes, 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 uh, Claire Wardle and I gave a talk on, um, talk and then a conversation at PDF this morning about uh, disinformation and democracy. So it was a nice way to start the morning. I, uh, I guess it's five o'clock. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think it's eight o'clock. But anyway, it's I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I am excited to start working with Alex. They hired me like yesterday. I passed my background check yesterday. Uh, so I wrote this talk yesterday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I'm going to rely a little bit on my notes here. But um, just by way of introduction, I spent the last four and a half years uh, researching what we've kind of come to call information disorder or malign narratives on the internet. I started looking at American conspiracy theorists. I was really interested in the anti-vaccine movement when I became a mom. I had a background in computer science, data science. Um, California Department of Public Health actually lets you download massive data sets about immunization, uh, immunization in schools. So I did that, started mapping anti-vax networks, and that was kind of what got me hooked on the realization that um, small groups of people were able to really disproportionately amplify messages uh, on social networks, and that was how I kind of got my start in this in 2015. Um, subsequent to that, I did some work with, uh, with the Obama administration as a, uh, through U.S. Digital Service, uh, just as an um, expert kind of brought in to the State Department for a month to look at ISIS. Uh, we began to have this realization back in 2015 that the social platforms were manipulatable in some ways that multiple different types of entities were using. And so the question became, how do we think about the fact that we've basically built uh, an ecosystem that really is facilitating uh, propagandist communications, uh, allowing, in this case, this was an ISIS uh, network. Uh, Jonathan Morgan and J.M. Berger did this, not me. Uh, but this is the ISIS Twitter census. We began to work together, terrorism researchers, network scientists, government, State Department, trying to say what is that we can do about this. Um, at the time, there was a sense that capabilities were scattered and nobody had any uh, assigned responsibilities, so gaps in kind of both of those fronts. There were conversations between, you know, should um, understanding of propaganda, network propaganda in particular, reside within the State Department? How should we be countering it? What was the role of the intelligence agencies? What was the role of, uh, of, of society? What was the role of the platforms? Academics were actually in some ways not really part of that conversation in 2015. Uh, but what we did begin to do was try to build um, convenings. There was one that leaked to the press. It was called the Madison Valleywood Project. And the Madison Valleywood Project was Madison Avenue, Silicon Valley, and Hollywood, all kind of coming together to think about what we could do as a whole of society approach to counter disinformation and to better understand it. So the takeaway over several years of looking at this, and as Alex mentioned, I wound up going on to work on uh, Russia for the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, is that disinformation is not a truth and narrative problem, right? It's a system manipulation problem. This is how I've come to think of it anyway. So the problem is less about what is being said, what the narrative is, what the actual message is, and it's more a function of how information traverses networks and how malign distribution in particular is something that we need to have a much more solid understanding of. Uh, so independent of what the message says, the question becomes how is the message spread? Um, this is the system. You know, the platforms kind of inadvertently set the rules of the game. They weren't really aware that they were designing it. We had this interesting, um, you know, as, uh, as the social ecosystem evolved, uh, it became loosely interconnected enough to allow for effortless sharing, so information could hop very easily, but not tightly connected enough to actually allow for uh, any kind of communication about what it was that was doing the hopping. So, the ecosystem, uh, ultimately, you know, many people besides ISIS and anti-vaxxers came to realize that this was dual-use technology, and that if you built a system to connect people to other people, uh, people who you did not necessarily want connecting with you could also similarly find you, and so this is the Internet Research Agency. Um, they began operating actually at the same time as ISIS, and when we were having the conversations about ISIS in government in 2015, one of the things we really wanted to avoid doing was inadvertently building solutions that were tailored to one adversary. Instead, we wanted to think about what could we do about the problem with the system as a whole. You didn't want to create the anti-ISIS task force. You wanted to create something that was bigger. We had no name for it. We called it like the Department of the Internet in you know, kind of back-channel communications. But what could we do to think about a whole-of-society approach for this? ISIS was really kind of remarkably different. I just got back from, uh, I was in Tallinn last week at NATO SciCon. And we were talking about um, the conversations really shifted much more into how do we think about ways that social network analysis can be used to have a quite quantitative understanding of the problem. And this is where the work is going. So um, just to talk briefly, uh, you know, something kind of tangible that I worked on recently was the Senate Intelligence Report. So I'll just touch on some of the ways in which um, 
we used network analysis to f look at what I would call you know, kind of three big buckets, right? So forensics is what I'm going to talk about now. How do we think about sets that have been attributed by other people and what we can learn from those data sets and what the takeaways, uh, what kind of takeaways we can get to inform future analyses? So in the IRA data set, the attribution was done by the platforms. And they did it using uh, kind of a focus on the assets. And, and when I use that term, I mean the operational assets, so the fake accounts. What kind of metadata was associated with the fake accounts? What were the email addresses, the IP addresses? How could they map the network using uh, looking at the network of assets? The other thing that they did was they looked at the collateral. And so the collateral was what was provided to me. Um, and the collateral was what you could call like the memes and the, and the content and, the, and the, the information that continues to kind of persist on the internet today. So we were doing analyses both on operational assets and how that network fit together so that we could understand distribution and dissemination, uh, but then also on the collateral, what are the narratives, what are the messages, how do we take this and understand what it looks like as other people pick it up and as it gets internalized by communities. So. Um, this is a really ugly picture that is not rendering very well in <laughs> Google Slides, sorry about that. Uh, but one of the things that we were trying to do is look at ways in which the Internet Research Agency networked their accounts together. So this is a poorly rendered, um, super low res it seems, uh, vision of uh, the squares were their pages, the parallelograms were their Instagram accounts, so Facebook pages, uh, Instagram accounts, and then the cloud-shaped things in the middle there, all the arrows indicate that uh, this content was pointing to other content. Um, the cloud-shaped things was actual authentic black media organizations. So real uh, black media Instagram accounts, real black media Facebook pages, and so we were looking at the ways in which uh, we could ascertain the extent to which they had infiltrated or integrated with uh, the black media community. So infiltration, uh, it, in um, they did some very literal infiltration, meaning they began to reach out to people who were running prominent pages, uh, asking them to share their content. We started to see a lot of uh, information indicating that they were engaging in active cross-promotion. So what, how do you think about ways in which a hostile intelligence service uh, kind of infiltrates a media community and builds this ecosystem by which all of their content is pointing not only to their to their other pages, so they're constantly referring people from one page to another, but also ways in which it's uh, integrated with the community. And this was one of the first indications that we had that it was actually going to be extremely difficult uh, going forward to separate out, you know, absent that metadata, just purely based on collateral, it was really hard uh, to try to ascertain what was theirs and what wasn't. So this is kind of where we're headed. This might render a little better. Uh, still doesn't look so good on the big screen, sorry. Um, so I'll just kind of go, go through these relatively quickly. Then this was looking at ways in which they built distinct networks, but uh, how they kind of loosely linked them topically. So they managed to link intersectional feminist accounts with their black community targeted accounts. And then the right wing kind of operated over off in its own silo. So if you looked from account, if you, if you did a network analysis based on the accounts, you could see these kind of ways that they had segmented American society and were kind of mapping out by issue and connecting people. But then interestingly, if you did the same analysis using the same Instagram set, but you looked rather uh, not at the account mentions, but at the hashtags, these were hashtags that appeared over a thousand times. Uh, so we went, you know, uh, pretty, pretty, actually pretty narrow because there were gazillions of hashtags. But um, you could see ways in which those conversations actually uh, came together around certain issues. So this was how we were trying to visualize what topics they thought were interesting from a polarization standpoint. So they would tweet um, anti-police content and pro-police content, and they would put them both into the hashtag police. And so these were the ways in which you could see, even though the audiences were quite distinct and the communities they were targeting were quite distinct and the accounts were operating in entirely separate networks. If you got down and you looked at it uh, from at a topical level, you could see the, um, the evidence of that kind of injecting tension into society uh, by, by, by taking that approach. But one of the things that's, uh, that Alex referred to is um, how do we move from forensics to proactive detection? So it does us no good to find out our elections have been interfered with and society has been interfered with. What we want to be able to do is take the learnings from uh, an operation, from a research project like that, and then have a sense of um, what we can use to kind of stage the campaign and think about it and how can we use the forensic analysis to inform uh, future detection capabilities? How do we build that out and make this a center for it? Um, one of the things that was very interesting was they had a lot of these little tells in the, in the original data set. You could see 
accounts that pretended to be American news organizations on Twitter were registered with Beeline phones or would use like Jakarta IP addresses. So there were these um, ways that we could uh, see these, these little errors and we don't anticipate that being possible going forward. So we're trying to think about where is this going and how do we think about disinformation as a kind of a stage process is something Alex and I have, have um, kind of both independently uh, began trying to do. And so I saw him give a talk and thought, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> we're talking about this in, uh, in very similar ways. Um, how do we think about this as a staged process? And if we can think about it as a staged process, can we design interventions and de design detection mechanisms um, more suited to the process? Because right now, we usually see it when it hits the kind of computational amplification phase where they're blasting it out en masse. What we want to be doing is uh, getting better at finding things during the creation of those operational assets and uh, disrupting the network as, as early as possible. And this, of course, does not apply only to Russia. Uh, the, we're thinking about this, like how can we come up with staged methodologies that are actor agnostic uh, so that we can have a, a, a framework for thinking about disinformation in a much more quantitative and um, descriptive way. Um, attribution is increasingly hard. <coughs> so. Some of what I did when I had the, you know, with the Russia data set was begin to, to, to look outward actually to say what, what, can, what kind of proactive uh, detection can we do from there just with the information that we had. And I found a handful of pages uh, actually in Arabic that, you know, Sputnik had embedded their own troll tweets basically. And so that led to Facebook pages and YouTube accounts. And so we were able just by tracing the content across the internet with really rigorous methodology like Google searches <laughs> to <laughs> Google search, reverse image search, 10i, I mean, the number of like, you know, trying to, to bring together the various uh, technologies that are commercially available. Um, this is something that I'm actually very excited to get to do here, uh, which is to, to kind of try it all out. Um, with the Russia set, it was a little bit different. It was, uh, you know, we had to be kept kind of siloed. But this page, uh, this page is actually a Facebook page that had the same name as an internet research agency Twitter account. So we thought, oh, this is fantastic. Here's a Facebook page. Um, then we dug more into it and realized that this is actually just run by somebody and it appears that the IRA cribbed the name of the page so it went the other direction. Um, but interestingly, the page had shared, uh, th there's four different IRA pages uh, represented um, in that, Jesus, what am I doing here? Okay, I'm just gonna not touch this computer. <laughs> um, so the, it, it kind of illustrates the challenges of attribution and detection going forward, which is how do you avoid uh, false positives? There's a lot of things where, um, you know, looking at the collateral, looking at image clusters, things like that will flag, but then it, there is still this very human element of actually getting in there, digging into the research, and uh, sorry, digging into the, um, the pages that pop up and trying to figure out what it is you're actually looking at. So one of the things that I think we have a lot of, an opportunity to really provide um, great value on that uh, Alex referred to also is tech companies are increasingly good at looking kind of intra-platform, so they're very much focused uh, within their silos. And then outside researchers have traditionally done research uh, inter-platform, so we look across the network. How do we find things um, that, that are spreading? How, how can we um, identify these hops in some ways before the platform might not see it, but uh, people who are looking at the ecosystem as a whole uh, have some visibility into it. So how do we take these two different orientations and bring them together? Uh, and then besides the forensics and the proactive detection, the third step is actually how do we take what we learn from this um, and use the information to empower and inform policymakers. And so I uh, got started doing that. Um, actually, we were kind of on opposite sides of this, I think, during the original tech hearings, <laughs> where um, I was, you know, with Tristan Harris going down to Senator Warner's office and saying, like, we need tech hearings. Um, and then I wrote a bunch of the briefing decks on helping them understand how this stuff was happening and and realizing that um, how did how could we convey to policymakers uh, what was happening, the, the extent of it, um, where we thought the gaps were, how could we prevail upon them to actually get the data sets from the tech companies? How could we then uh, come up with a structured way for them to do the research because they weren't really capable of doing the research internally, which is one of the reasons why uh, I did it as an outsider. Um, so thinking about how do we empower policymakers from a election integrity standpoint, from a national security standpoint, uh, how do we help them understand the balances and the trade-offs between you know, privacy and security and some of these issues? Uh, how do we work not only within the U.S., but also uh, overseas as people are beginning to think about how this impacts their, uh, their countries, their elections, and their cultures? 
So ultimately, it's an opportunity to, um, to, to, to actually execute in some ways on what we weren't necessarily ready to do in 2015, which is to take the whole of society approach to the problem. People are much more aware uh, of the threat now. The lawmakers are much more aware of, of what has happened. Uh, we've seen these operations carried out not just by state actors, but by everything from domestic ideologues to mercenaries to spammers. So how can we think about um, ways to create a center of gravity uh, in interdisciplinary studies, a uh, place for researchers from all over to work together and then also to work with government and other stakeholders uh, to make an impact here. So thank you so much and uh, excited to start working. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. As you can tell, we're only hiring people that can speak as fast as I can. Uh, I know, I'm sorry, I'm from no, no, New York. Great. I always try to slow it down. We're gonna time Shelby now. <laughs> Okay, great. I'll take that. So, anybody have any questions? We just got a couple minutes, I think. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Valerie. I'm a student researcher. And I was just curious to know your opinion about um, all the ad hoc solutions that are being approached to problems such as this. Um, whether you think there should be an industry-wide standard or if there is some benefit to keeping things to ad hoc solutions in regards to misinformation, for example. I think one of the problems with ad hoc solutions is um, there are certain trade-offs. And as things like uh, GDPR is a great example, right? So there's ways in which we've taken certain actions on privacy that have um, seriously negative effects for security researchers. Um, how do we think about ways to really understand how the system works at a system level and the understanding that if you uh, change one thing, you're potentially going to impact something else. So how can we think a little bit more holistically about that? Um, there are, you know, there, there are some significant efforts happening in individual states that are also interesting because, you know, California can get certain things done in ways that uh, other states can't. The California privacy was one example of this. Um, the problem is, you know, it does kind of, in some ways that can spur federal action and lead to a better law coming at that level. Uh, but otherwise, unfortunately, it just kind of balkanizes things and leaves us in a position where we're then trying to um, fix or undo or change what was done. wins. Well, I, I, well, well, I win. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, nice to see you, Elena. Um, uh, hi, I'm Mike McFall from FSI. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, this is the first time I've ever seen the phrase whole of society approach, right? I've seen whole of government approach for many, many years working in the government. Yep. Um, so that's fantastic. But Good I want to understand, Warner. and it's actually for both of you, because you talked about it earlier today, Alex, how does a whole of society approach interface with a whole of government approach and a whole of business approach? And I'm, I'm interested both in, in what you know, because both of you know a lot about what, you know, lots of people in the industry are doing what you're talking about doing, and lots of people in the government I know, and you know, are, are also doing that. Is there any synergies from interaction or are the norms of that interaction uh, actually the opposite, right? I'm thinking of, of like basic democratic governance kinds of questions. Civil society by definition has to be interactive with the government, but it also has to be distant from it. I think of the same thing with business. And, and Alex, in particular, I've heard you say this before, so not to make it so abstract, in 2016, uh, the government was chasing a lot of the actors that you were talking about, uh, and they came to you rather late in the day. I, I think I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, I've heard, yeah, it's been said that the FBI <laughs> was thinking about these things and then came to you, uh, uh, other government, other non-governmental actors, including the platform companies, but that, that you think that was a pretty flawed approach. Are there ways to to have synergies between that triangle or almost by definition do they have to have some distance from each other? And I'm particularly interested as a university, like what is our normative way of interacting with the FBI, with the CIA, 
uh, with the Pentagon. I just said hello to Secretary Mattis, who's just joined us. He, he's a new colleague of ours as of 30 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> You're not the latest uh, hire. I know. Just so you know. <laughs> you can go call Secretary Mattis the newbie. Go, go give him a noogie. Yeah. Do, do you want to do first? Uh, I think one, so um, Hall of Society is uh, Mark Warner's, actually, is, uh, is his phrase. Yeah, from Center for a New American um, Society, Security, CNES, the think tank down in DC. He gave a talk on this in December 2018. And, um, and I liked it a lot because it was, you know, I had been working with the Senator's office by that point for just about a year, I think. And there was a recognition that the platforms were always going to be the sort of first line of defense from, from the business standpoint, right? So as adversaries evolve, there is no regulation that you're going to pass fast enough that is going to make a dent uh, there. And so empowering them to act and to act responsibly to create oversight, of course, but uh, to, to, to continue to keep that capability where it is. Um, academics had been instrumental, I think, in a number of the Senate hearings, a number of the, uh, I, I testified in August and two of the people on the panel were academics. Um, the recognition that a lot of the research was happening uh, in academia, but that was also very long-term as opposed to the more immediate kind of work that was actually happening mostly in uh, for-profit, a lot of for-profit companies that had begun to develop detection capabilities because the government couldn't. And that was another interesting piece there, right, which is that way in which um, there is a role for, this is why defense contractors exist, but, um, but again, on, on that, that same front, uh, thinking about what new and emerging technologies, machine learning teams, things like that, that was largely in the private sector. Then I think in the senator's remarks, if I recall, he also does refer to things like um, media literacy and citizen informedness, and that's where I think it comes to society as opposed to just government and business. Uh, and so the, um, you know, I took a trip to uh, to Tallinn and I took a trip to Stockholm and I met some of the people who designed the um, counter propaganda campaigns for for Sweden and for Estonia to try to help them understand, uh, help their citizens understand, help their citizens become better informed, recognizing that demand is also a piece of this. It's not just a supply problem. Yeah. So on the um, specific question about cooperation with with government, uh, in 2016, we had a really good relationship with the government <coughs> on traditional cyber threat actors. Uh, so like the GRU activity, what what we knew, we turned over to them. They had information from other folks. There's a whole controversy about victim notification, obviously, and their relationship with the DNC. But from our perspective, that was a good two-way relationship. And there was a good two-way relationship on ISIS and their propaganda operations. There was no relationship on organized government disinformation actors. We received no information from the government of any use in 2016 for most of 2017. So effectively, everything you read in the Mueller report, we had to find organically ourselves without any technical indicators. Starting in 2018, that changed. Um, and so it is it's still unclear to me, and the kind of thing that if we had a 9-11 commission, we'd know of, is this, people were studying this in the government, but they didn't have a relationship with the tech companies. Is it, um, that nobody was studying the government, and it really was kind of a collective failure of both in private and public industry, like I talked about before, that you have people who are drawn from the same pool of skill sets that we're all kind of looking at the terrorist actors, threat actors, uh, cyber threat actors, and not at the propaganda. Um, when I think of the whole of society, I think something closer to, it is closer to the whole of government plus a little bit of private, in that if you, uh, when we worked on shortly after the US election and we we're in the middle of our investigation what happened in the US election, we had to deal with the German and French elections. And in both Germany and France, we had much better partners in the government because they have defensive cybersecurity agencies who have the ability to coordinate a whole of government approach. Um, and so uh, in Germany, it's called the BSI. In France, it's called ANSI. And these organizations have access to classified data. They have access to threat information, but they are not law enforcement. Uh, so if you're an executive at a company, you're allowed to meet with them without lawyers present, uh, which is not true, uh, often with US law enforcement. Um, and then they also were, were seen as apolitical enough that other than the far right parties, they were directly plugged into the security protections it, uh, to like the IT people and the security teams at the major political parties. And so I think moving towards a model, in the US we don't have a single defensive cybersecurity agency. You have super offensive units at NSA and Cyber Command. You have good defensive people at DHS, but they're totally understaffed and overworked. Um, and then in theory, uh, you know, FBI has really good people, but they're 
in a very much law enforcement mission, not in a preventative mission. And in theory, this is supposed to come out of the White House, but that's just not happening right now. And so what we might want to move towards is a, a model where we have a defensive agency that can coordinate these things as well as we've seen some of our allies do. <coughs> And I think that would help. And then the other thing that was in our report was the recommendation for the companies to coordinate better and to create a single point of contact. Because it is true, if you're the government and you're like, okay, well, we have some general information about some actor in Iran, uh, propaganda actor, from their perspective, they have that kind of intelligence of what's going on and perhaps intelligence from offensive ap operations against other people's groups. They don't actually see the data we have. Post Snowden, with the closure of a bunch of the holes they were using in the Snowden, they see data on the social networks through a microscope. They have to have a specific request for a specific account, either on the classified or unclassified side. And so um, it is this difficult problem of they've got all this strategic vision and perhaps knowledge of threat actors, and we've got all the data, and how do you merge those up in a way that is protective of civil liberties is really tough. And this is part of our conversation with Jack Goldsmith, is one of the things we got to think about is the entire legal structure for those relationships are highly legalized by laws that assume that any data that moves between the government and the companies is for the prosecution of US citizens. And that is not true in this case. And so one of the things we need to look at is are there ways that we can work together on preventing these things where nobody's going to go to jail, nobody's going to go get indicted, and therefore there are there's a relationship that can exist that that is a little less about paperwork, effectively. Um, but that that is a very hard civil liberties balancing action that I think is is not easy, but is something we should think about probably after 2020. David Clinch, question here. I don't know if this is on. Yeah. Um, Renee and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but how do you handle the issue, there's two related issues, of in some cases using Christchurch as an example of needing to sort of have an always-on approach to looking at these things. And, and what I mean by that is how do you, uh, as a researcher, I know on the news side how I do it, but as a researcher, how do you approach the problem that if you're not up and on and looking, you might yeah. miss data, you might miss um, patterns, you might miss something, that's happening in real time, do you need a real time, always on approach to this kind of new research? And then secondly, how do you handle the issue, you're talking about misinformation, disinformation, cybersecurity, extremist content, you know, different teams, different, different uh, you know, uh, uh, disciplines, I suppose. How do you handle that this, these issues are all mucked together sometimes? So for both of you. I can speak to the always on thing a bit. I mean, uh, as, as we were discussing, um, you know, I was a trader back in the day and when we had global ETFs, we just always had somebody who was on call. It was just handed from one person to another to another. Uh, how to do that within a center is something that we haven't really discussed yet. But in general, I do think that um, there, I mean, there are a lot of models for this. There's, uh, you know, the on-call beeper type model where you, you know, you have certain alerts and you get an alert. Um, it's sort of unclear how to do that with, you know, the realization that a lot of that stuff right now is very keyword dependent and then you're kind of boiling the ocean because what keyword, I mean, as you saw with Christchurch and, and as I saw with Christchurch, um, for, for those who don't know, Christchurch hit 8chan first. Uh, I actually did get a notification about it from one of my analysts at, the, at New Knowledge where I was at the time um, who said, this isn't our thing, but somebody should take a look at this. Uh, and then my response was to look at it and to call a friend at YouTube and say, hey, I'm uh, single digit viewer on this thing. I think you have a mass shooting on your platform. I think you should probably do something. Mm -hmm. And so that is an extremely, um, that is not the way that, that we want this to go going forward. And I think that that is where we, there's a realization that, um, you know, it, it did flag, it did get to somebody, it got to me within 20 minutes. Um, but I, I definitely believe that there are things that we need to do to have a better understanding of uh, how to route information appropriately between all of the different people who need to know. Yeah, I mean, part of taking this job is I don't get called at 3 a.m. anymore. Um, so, <laughs> I, look, I mean, most most of the academic research, I think, the ne part of our goal is to build infrastructure where we're recording a bunch of this stuff and we yeah. do have the ability to look the next day. Um, if we move into a model where we have analysts who, you know, I, I don't, we're not going to move into an on-call model, but I, I do think there's also a global community here. Um, and so part of the idea here is we could also try to plug into that global community and you get tipped off from somebody who happens to be awake because they're in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, it, that's the kind of thing. On the, you're totally right. Like, we're talking about a bunch of different issues. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
what we're going to be doing is we're going to be picking out a couple of key things that we care a lot about. We're going to be looking uh, at the effect of these kinds of issues on developing democracies. We're going to be studying a couple of developed democracies that we think are very high risk. And then we're going to be building the infrastructure necessary to do that. The thesis is that infrastructure, just like the Hubble Space Telescope, is mostly reusable, right? And so I am not sure what happens after that, after we have the ability to do other stuff. Um, but we're trying to find three or four what we would call MVP, minimally viable product, uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley, three or four things to shoot for for MVP. Um, and then we'll see where we go from there and organically grow our capabilities, our human capabilities, uh, as we see what we're able to do with the technical capabilities we build. Um, I think we're running out of time, right? Is okay. We'll do one, a couple more. Words. Okay, great. Well, why don't you guys both ask your question? We'll we'll speed around it. Um, thank <coughs> you so much uh, for your talk. Uh, I I'll be really brief with my question. Uh, how do we address? I'll do my best. Um, how do we address the the challenge of improving human capital within government uh, on these issues you highlighted? The sort of you know inadequacy of sort of congressional staffers supporting their senators and and Congress people. It seems like the executive branch has got a little more together. Um, but sort of is it just a question of attracting talent from Silicon Valley, or is that just going to sort of create the same problems that you've referenced a few times today of of uh, this sort of bleed over where it's the same skill set, same folks, etc. Thanks. Don't you ask. Uh, Ian Wallace. <coughs> excuse me, New America, um, you sort of mentioned this in sort of passing, but could you just say a little bit more about how you see the research network developing, including the international aspects, you know, as cl clearly the way to leverage the international, even domestic sort of expertise is networking, but it's, I can see that's also going to be particularly challenging in this space. I'll take the first one. I need okay. to answer the first one. Go ahead. The one. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of efforts regarding the, the talent piece. So, under President Obama, U.S. Digital Service was a little bit more proactive, and that was because a lot of it was driven by the executive branch, which, as Alex has mentioned, is not actually functioning in quite the way that we would like to see, perhaps. Um, the, um, <laughs> the That was diplomacy. good. That was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, um, there's a couple, of, there's actually some really interesting efforts. So Office of uh, the OTA, which was, I think, dissolved under Gingrich. I'm not a historian here, but... Um, Zach Graves and some of the folks at Lincoln Network are, uh, just actually put out a um, call to try to generate a little bit more you know, funding and actually uh, recreate this, this office of technical expertise, basically, um, to provide uh, assistance. Um, the bipartisan organizations that they got as signatories to that are just like extraordinary. Um, so uh, there was such a response to that call from uh, so many of the different civil society orgs, particularly the tech ones in Silicon Valley. So that was very encouraging. Uh, there is U.S. Digital Service. You know, Matt Cutts from Google is down there heading it now. He's incredible. Um, they're always looking for people. I think the challenge is a lot of people don't want to be associated with the brand of the administration, and that's been a challenge. So the question becomes, there's also efforts through um, the Defense Department has a similar program, and I think that that maybe is having not as much of a difficult time because it is much more of a nonpartisan kind of environment. Um, but there's uh, efforts underway, and I look forward to plugging into all of those. And, and we're doing our part here by trying to train students in these kinds of practical aspects, right? I'd love for a number of graduates from the master's program to have a <coughs> background of the MIP. Great. Uh, so we will be listing our research assistant uh, positions pretty soon. Um, but the goal is I'd like students here to learn from Renee how you do a Multigo graph and like how do you do, uh, how do you use uh, IPython notebook, right? And how do you do a, a transform across the petabyte of data uh, to then pull out these connections? Like that's the kind of practical skills that um, I think combined with the rigorous academic uh, background people are getting in the master's program here could be very useful. And on the other side, on the international side, I mean, we're, we are trying to network with them. There's a real problem here that there's, um, every university wants to be good at this, and very few of them have people with any actual experience. Um, and that is reflected in the output uh, of a number of people who have more opinion than data. Um, I'm not going to mention anybody. So we're going to try to be very careful to only team up with other centers where we think we can have uh, a reasonable interplay of the same kind of uh, standards of both like the quality of the data and then especially on attribution. Attribution standards, like Renee said, is going to be the fascinating problem for 2020 in that uh, you have... Every university, every political party, uh, 
every uh, group from both sides of the aisle in all these countries who are motivated to be the ones who find the next Russian campaign. And so they are calling everything a foreign disinformation operation, not applying any kind of the standards that we would have applied inside the tech companies or the government would apply internally. Um, and so that's actually something I hope we can talk publicly about is that as we build out our center, we'll be building out our attribution standards, our theories of the case. We will be ha we will have a team that overlooks us that includes people from outside Stanford who red team our assumptions. Uh, that's like what good intelligence teams do is that you have people whose type job it is to red team and to come up with other theories of the case of why your attribution might be incorrect. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff that hopefully we can do here and we can, we can spread out and see some other universities adopt. Cool, thank you for your time. Thank you.